Oh. Welcome to PTU Barbell episode 10. Today we have Steve Lewington, currently an actor, a former WWE wrestler and all-round great guy, um, legend from <laughs> Winash. Um, went to the Forest School if you're from there. So, you know, big, Long he's time a big ago. name now. <laughs> Long time ago. Long time ago. If well, I don't, I'm now. No, that was relatively Steve. recent. It's fine. <laughs> 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 it's good to have, uh, good to be here, guys. Thanks for having me. That's right, man. That's right. So the first thing like we always like to try and get to on the podcast is how did it all start out for you? Um, obviously, you're the closest looking thing to Arnold Schwarzenegger that I've seen. Um, so let's go from where it all started for you, my man. Uh, first of all, my ego thanks you. That's always the best compliment anyone can get. Um, do you mean as in like uh, in fitness training and in, in, in wrestling? In which, in which way? Uh, so let's start with your training. What brought you to to training because obviously when you started your wrestling um you was already in great shape so you, was was you just was you just born like that or was it maybelline <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's, you know what I, I put it i put it down to um to my dad to be honest with you because i was always like a, a fat no a chubby kid let's say um but he was my dad was always like really into sports like his his background county level he was his belief was always if you're going to play a sport like anything else like try and take it to your highest level so he was always like trying to get me go go down the field, go running with me, uh, kicking a football, practicing rugby. Um, but I was I was just kind of more resilient to it when I was younger because I didn't I did it for for fun, but I didn't have that that, that same drive. It wasn't until I got a bit older um, and I started my my growth spurt. I started to stretch out a little bit um, that I realised, yeah, you know, okay, so this uh, maybe I could you know look a certain way or I could be a certain thing. Um, so I'd say certainly my dad got me into it, but didn't start training or at least I, I missed about uh when I was like 15 or 16 years old there used to be like the typical this is old school days in gyms but used to be like the kids club Saturday morning kids club down the gym you know 10 to 11 or something like that you know you do a few machines um but yeah uh I, I guess I started training more uh seriously when I was about 18 or so um and I obviously got I was watching wrestling at that time so I was kind of had an idea in my mind of what it could look like and Obviously, like you guys as well, the movies, Arnold, like you said, you know, it was such a it was such a great physique to like aspire to. You know, it was unbelievable, but yet it still looked achievable or realistic somehow. It was that balance. Um, so yeah, so definitely I'd say movies influenced it a lot for me as well. So did the did the the bodybuilding lead to the wrestling or the was the wrestling always in goal? Did you use the the bodybuilding to get the physique for a wrestler to then pursue that? I think for me first, it, it was always like the the, uh, the the bodybuilding. It was like getting that image, um, realizing that I had a shape that I, I could, you know, uh, put on, you know, like a, a good a good looking uh, amount of, of muscle mass. Um, certainly kind of like retroactively, I tried to be more athletic as well. So even though my dad tried to do all this stuff later on, um, you know, I, I was uh, you know trying to be athletic as well. So the bodybuilding, the training definitely preceded uh, the wrestling goals. But then once... I found wrestling um, and I considered that as something I wanted to do. Then obviously it was a big driving uh, force. It made me want to kind of like knuckle down and uh, take my training more seriously as well. Well, so um, you went to a forest. Did anything, did anything happen at a school um, with sports wise? How did you get into wrestling? It seems like I've never even, if someone said to me, oh, I want to do wrestling, I'd be like, I don't know where to go for that. So was it something from school or did you just Google it? I don't know, yellow page it? <laughs> no, it was um, it was actually like totally from from school, from uh, oh. from the sixth form in Forest School. That's that's where I, I even got the first inkling. I I had that kind of happy middle ground by the time I got to Forest Sixth Form where I was a nerd, but yet I also played uh, in Forest Rugby as well. So I kind of, I was in both camps kind of thing as, as well. So, um, and I remember it really clearly to this day. Um, again, this is like old school day, sixth form. You're around the uh, the communal TV. You're watching MTV and stuff like that. Um, and I think you know this guy as well because he used to play uh, rugby for uh, Gensians as well. Do you know uh, uh, Jao Costa? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, and he, uh, sorry, excuse me. He was doing an impersonation of uh, of The Rock. He, he just watched like Monday Night Raw, I think, the night before. Um, and he was doing this promo. He was, re he was like doing an impression of The Rock and he was doing a pretty good one. And he was having like a, uh, more and more people were gathering around him, you know, laughing at what he was saying. <laughs> and at this point, I, I wasn't watching wrestling at all. I had no idea what he was talking about, but I knew that he was funny. And I knew that he had all these guys listening around. So of course I, you know, I listened, I laughed. 
and that made me want to watch wrestling. So I thought, oh, you know, I can get in on the joke. You know, I can actually have context to what the hell he's talking about. Um, so yeah, I completely uh, hold Joao Costa and uh, the four six one responsible for me getting into uh, into wrestling in the first place. So, so uh, where did you go to to learn wrestling? Where where was that? Like, where did that take you? Yeah, so um, it, a lot of it was really. It sounds really cliche, but a lot of it was just right time, right place, right opportunity in terms of discovering things and going for things and, and, and getting results. So once I started to watch wrestling after, um, you know, Xiao uh, turned me on to it, I think it was only a few weeks maybe into watching wrestling. I heard one of the, the commentators, uh, Jim Ross, who's like a legendary um, wrestling commentator at the time. Uh, and he actually mentioned the name of the school where at the time WWE, it was like their farm system, their developmental system, um, which was OVW, Ohio Valley wrestling. So once I heard that name mentioned and it was discussed, or these are where some of these big big guys had got their start or where they'd been trained up. So then I started to follow online you know, OBW and you know, just learning more about them. And then from there, it was seemed like only a, it was a few weeks. And then they had announced their their first ever tryout camp. So they, they made an announcement. So uh, they were going to take on 50 people um, of all different um, experience levels, you know, guys who'd been doing it for years, guys who just started guys like me who had no idea whatsoever. Um, so I put an application for it and I was one of the 50 guys um, that got picked out. So wow. lots, lots of luck, but again, just, you know, right time, right place. It's, it was, it was quite bizarre how it, how it worked out. That's fucking awesome, man. Yeah. Uh, how did you come across your wrestling names that go through some of your, you've got about five, I think. So there's, there's a few, there's a, there's a few and a few um, variations of them. Right. So um, let's see. So when, when I, when I went to OBW um, and I, I started to uh, perform on TV, I just went by my name, Steve Lewington, you know, and that's fine. Um, that back then there was no trademark or anything else. Like these days, if you're <laughs> WWE superstar, you, you go by Steve Lewington and if you retire or if you step down, whatever, they own the rights to your name. So you can't call yourself Steve. Um, but when I was wrestling in the UK, um, I went by Steve Sonic. Um, don't ask me why. I was thinking of maybe Guile from Street Fighter, Sonic Boom. I, that was the name of my finish as well, the Sonic Boom. Yeah. I used to uh, I used to call out Sonic and then all the little kids and buttons and stuff would go boom. And I, you know, if I can hit the move. Um, so that was fun. Uh, <laughs> and then... When I was wrestling in America, um, tried a few different variations, but I, I called myself towards the end uh, Jack Gabriel. Don't know why, you know, it sounded uh, it sounded good. But then when I was getting ready to get called up, um, there was already a guy called Jack Swagger who would recently got uh, brought up onto TV. So when the creative team heard about this, they said, "Oh, you can't be Jack. We've already got a Jack. You're DJ." And that was the, that was the thought process behind it. So Jack Gabriel turned to DJ Gabriel. No, no, there's no, there's no backstory to DJ. It's just like your DJ, you know, <laughs> they, they were quite keen on like, um, like acronyms or not acronyms, but, uh, uh shortened down initials. You know, you had a uh, DH Smith who was, um, the son of, um, David boy Smith, um, fucking ledge. You had uh, TJ Wilson as well. You had, um, stampede kid as well. So they were, they, they were going through phases and they liked initials at that point. Um, and then they somehow made up a backstory that I was, um, I met a wedding planner when I was wrestling in the UK and I was the DJ at the wedding and she was the wedding planner and we got together and we came over to WWE. So that was, <laughs> there, was there was, there was no thought into my, no, into my, no, into my backstory. <laughs> yeah, that's it. It's, it. There was, there was no thought. There was no plan. It's literally, okay, here's a guy, DJ Gabriel. Here's this girl, Alicia Fox. Uh, she's a wedding planner. Cause I think she had the gimmick of a wedding planner before I got caught up. So they kind of retroactively fit me in some kind of Vegas connection. And then, you know, we did our thing on, uh, on TV together. <laughs> yeah. There was, there was no plan. Sometimes you see these guys get brought up and there was like a, there's a vignette, they get a series of videos that kind of introduce them, you know, kind of build them up so that when you see them, they're like, Oh, okay. You know, this is this guy, you know, he's like this. No, it was like one day, here's this guy in disco spandex and he's dancing to the ring. Um, it was yeah. It's one of those uh, deep end sink or swim kind of things. <laughs> you had some uh, really cool wins, but I was reading your first loss was against Mark Henry, and he's a big dude. What was it like wrestling him on in the in the ring, man? 
How yeah, much did he weigh first? Was he yeah. he was known as the fridge, wasn't he? Um, honestly, I I don't know. I I never heard him. I never heard him uh, referred to as the fridge. I mean, I, I pretty much, I thought the world's strongest man was pretty much a good moniker to go by. Yeah. Um, I th- the time that match on TV was actually the second time I wrestled him because I I had wrestled him and the WWE in in a dark match that was not televised. Um, and it went pretty well. You know, it was a very basic match. You know, um, obviously Mark's a big guy. He'd been doing it for a while. But in terms of like his moveset, you know, he's kind of limited in what he does because he doesn't need to do a lot. You know, like the, the simplest of moves done by a guy that size looks devastating. You know, so he could do a clothesline and call it a finish. He doesn't need to do a, <laughs> a double a double back salt, triple spine buster or anything like that. You know, just the basic stuff looks deadly. So the match was was pretty basic, but um, we, we got along well. You know, he was happy with it. Um, obviously the, the higher ups thought, okay, so we can put this match on TV because, you know, they've had the, the, uh, the dark version. Now we'll, we'll tweak it and we'll put them on TV. Um, unfortunately, I think I must've had a, a falling out with Mark Henry because when we were, I remember when we were putting the match together, um, I was very respectful, but I was offering up, uh, suggestions. I was like, you know, Hey Mark, you know, what do you think about this? Or, um, I, I had an idea for this, or, you know, tell me what you think about this. But I think, and I found this out after the match, that uh, I think he would have preferred it if I'd have just said nothing whatsoever uh, and just done whatever he wanted to do. But I was I was only making suggestions. I was not saying, we're going to do this, we're going to do that. Anyway, if you watch the match, you, you might, maybe you'll notice, maybe you won't, but there wasn't a very accommodating um, match. You know, it was, it was, you could, I'm not sure. Watching it back, I could tell that he was, annoyed and I later later found out that he was annoyed um but yeah you know whatever I found that it was his manager at the time I think Tony Atlas and uh he said you, you may want to go and talk to Mark so I spoke to Mark and I said look you know I, I apologize for any disrespect I was just you know trying to think of what you can do and Mark was fine with it afterwards and he said okay cool man no worries and that was it but um yeah it, it wasn't a very um it wasn't a great match in terms of what we did in the ring again it was it was really basic but certainly he's the biggest physical dude um, that I ever went against. Uh, obviously, if he wanted to, you know, he could kill you. So even when he picks you up and he does that big slam, it does knock the wind out of you a bit. Yeah. But obviously, if he wanted to actually hurt you, you'd be dead. So uh, you know, he was, you know, he was professional. Um, but I think he also let me know that you know, next time, kid, shut the fuck up, and <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what we're going to do. <laughs> <laughs> who was your favorite wrestler? Who was like, who was like the fun, the fun one in the back? Uh, what not not one that I necessarily had a match with, but just like one of my favorite guys, just like, like like hanging around, maybe good to be around, like good yeah. luck. Um, Chris Jericho is is yeah, always yeah. the one that comes out. He um, when I had my debut ma- match as well, he was actually the only guy who came backstage to find me afterwards, and he you know just kind of gave me some some basic feedback on it. You know, he came back, he said, oh, you know, good match, man. Um, you know, this and this look good, or you know, maybe you know, try you know, maybe maybe don't do this and stuff. So he was from, you know, so professionally, you know, he was awesome. Um, and I was always grateful for that. But we also uh, had a bit of a laugh. And, and by no means am I trying to say, oh, me and Jericho were best buds. You know, we, you know, he was he was here. I was down here. But it never stopped us from having a laugh. Um, my music, my entrance music I came out to at the time was uh, it was like a cross between Prince and um, uh, I, I, I forget the one, but it was lots of like high notes. And it was like, hey. You know, it's all these kind of like random, like thriller style notes. So, um, you know, he 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 thought the music was funny. So we're walking down the corridor, we'd see each other, and then we wouldn't actually say anything until we got really close to each other. And then I turn to him and go, "Hey!" And he'd look at me and go, "Hey!" <laughs> and just <laughs> and just carry on walking past. Um, yeah, and I think my my claim to fame on Raw was I lent him my tie once for a promo. I think that's probably the greatest contribution I did to Monday Night Raw was I lent my tie to Chris Jericho <laughs> and that was it. But no, he was, he was really good, but there, there were others who were fine. I mean, I never, um, I mean, I, I'd barely really begun to like scrape the tip of the iceberg when I was up there, but I'd obviously, I'd been around the guys and I, I, I talked to them. Uh, Randy Orton was, uh, was, was very cool. Um, he, he liked to mess with you, but if he didn't mess with you, it's because he didn't think anything, anything of you. Um, I was lucky. I was really fortunate that I did get to uh, see Eddie Guerrero uh, backstage before uh, before his passing. Um, so I'm glad I got to see him uh, in person. But no, I, I never had any any beef with anyone. Um, 
just make sure that you do what Mark Henry says exactly how he says it. <laughs> what's um? I, I see. I'm not very um, good with the wrestling terms. I was I was reading. What's a jobber? So a jobber is someone who is brought in to do a job for someone else. So uh, take for example, you know, say it was me, and 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 certainly I I had matches against jobbers, and the point of the matches were to get me over, you know, to get me over with with the audience you know to make them sit up to take notice of me to um to you know demonstrate what i can do you know to highlight some moves like establish some stuff basically so normally it doesn't always happen but what tends to happen is that if you've got a new guy coming in and obviously you want to establish him or you want to try and you know make people familiar with him is that you normally get um some local wrestlers to the the city um that you're working in and then they come in and then basically you know whatever it is three, four minutes less, doesn't matter. If you're a huge monster, you're going to tear through them like toilet paper. Um, but basically you bring in these, these local boys and you just bump them around, just bump the hell out of them, demonstrate what you can do. Um, and the idea being to get you over. So people sit up and think, huh, you know. So a bit DJ, like a, a journey man in boxing. So build the hype of a new, you know, like a, a prospect. So you get yeah. maybe an older boxer that's been on the scene for a longer time and you know they they move around and but their 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 job is to ultimately make the the new guy look good exactly and it's also as well it's not a completely one-way street i mean obviously the main point of business is to get the ww guy the new guy try to build him up but also these guys these um you know the you know the jobbers the local guys coming in obviously it's also their chance to be seen as well you know so for a lot of these guys who start off as you know jobbers you know they actually end up uh, getting signed to contracts, you know, not every time, but obviously if the company sees something in them and I think, yeah, you know, whether, you know, he, um, he sold those reactions. Well, he's in good shape. You know, he didn't mess up. Then it's a way for these guys to get seen as well. But yeah, it's, it's designed to get someone over in, in the company. Who, um, who was uh, say like your favorite wrestler when you were growing up? Did you get to meet them? Um, who was like your inspiration? You mentioned obviously the rock impersonation got you into it, but was there anyone when you started following it, you were like, wow, because obviously like there might be different eras. My era was Hulk Hogan, Ultimate Warrior, those kind of- yeah, My era was Rikishi's bottom. <laughs> yeah, you love a stick face. You love a good stick face. Um, yeah, I mean, in, in terms of an entertainer, you know, there's there are a few who are better than the rock. And obviously right now, I mean, he saw the success he had in the company. He's gone on and, you know, apart from the fact he's the highest paid actor in the world right now, like he's got like a hundred different projects on the go. I've still got to try some of his tequila. Um, but in terms of like an entertainer, I mean, The Rock was great. Uh, the, the ability to cut a promo, you know, to speak on the mic. He was one of, if not, you know, the best at the time when I was there. So that was certainly someone to, um, uh, to you know, to shoot for in terms of how you can connect with an audience. Um I mentioned Chris Jericho and it was the same when, because I don't lie, when I was, when I got into wrestling, I was older, I was 18, you know, when I started watching wrestling on a regular basis. But although I was 18, my wrestling mental age was if I was like seven or eight years old, you know, I, I would go to these arena shows, I would still make signs, you know, I'd go in the chat rooms, you know, I'd make mixtapes of wrestlers entrances, you know, I kind of, (laughs) I regressed basically like 10 years, you know, when I, when I discovered wrestling. But um, when I got into it, there was a big feud between The Rock and Chris Jericho. And I still remember being annoyed as, as a mark, you know, as, a, as an uneducated fan, that you had The Rock who looked the way he did, you know, awesome physique, you know, strong, powerful, everyone loved him. And then you had Chris Jericho, who was this smaller guy, this really annoying guy, but somehow he could beat The Rock. And I remember thinking, oh, man, that's just dog. How can he beat The Rock? But that's when I got into wrestling more as a performer, you realize how good that was of Chris Jericho that as a as a performer he could make you believe that because of his athleticism he could hang with the rock so certainly Chris Jericho was someone um that I really admired and respected I'm, and like I said I'm glad that I got to to meet him um if there was one wrestler let's say like the HBK or the Ric Flair everyone's got theirs and obviously those guys are like awesome but for me it was uh Randy Orton um in terms of someone that I really connected with just the way he moved in the ring um his athleticism, how like care, you know, how carefree, just how easy he made stuff look. I mean, he looked like a million bucks. Um, and yeah, it, it, it wasn't that he cut amazing promos on, on, on the mic necessarily, but in terms of like a, a complete package, 
I always think like Randy Orton, if there was like a handful of guys that I wish I'd had a chance to have a match with, um, Randy Orton, I think would be, Randy Orton, Chris Jericho, definitely those two guys would be top of my list. And Eddie, of course. But um, yeah, he 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 passed away, uh, you know, before I got going properly when I was up there. Right. That's wicked, man. Um, so everyone wants to know how much does wrestling actually hurt? <laughs> my my simple answer would be that accumulatively it it hurts a lot um and it only takes it only takes one bad bump uh one miscalculation um and you know at, at the very least you're going to get knocked up uh concussed um at the worst it can end your career um instantly and i mean something that didn't happen a million years ago there was a girls match um there's a there's a, a, a female wrestler called Paige and she left and she's, and she's back with the company now. But she was having, I think, uh, a tag match. Um, by the way, this is long after I, I was done with, with wrestling. I think this was maybe a, a couple of years, a few years ago. And uh, she took a very in, innocent looking move or just what seemed like a basic move. She, I think she ran, I think she ran into a turnbuckle. Uh, and as she turned her back, there was a girl in the corner and they jumped up and they kicked, they, they meant to kick her in the back. But I think they kicked her so hard that the whiplash effect on the neck. Um, I think she, she suffered an injury that way. And, you know, that was it. You know, she stopped wrestling. Um, so there's, to, to, to answer your question, um, it does hurt, but like anything, your, your body um, does kind of get used to it. You know, your body toughens up, you know. When you have never wrestled before and you take your first back bump, you think, oh my God, how the hell am I meant to do this? Like, you know, 20 times a match, thousands of times. But it's like anything, you know, it's like uh, your first rugby tackle, you know, when you tackle someone, you know, you might think, oh, that really hurt my shoulder. How? But then, you know, you, you, you toughen up to it. You learn how to, um, you know, meet the, meet the tackle, for example. So it doesn't feel so much, but over the years, you know, it, it's wear and tear, it's bump and grind. Um, not like the R. Kelly bump and grind, but like. The, <laughs> the, the, we won't go there. The more damaging. Yeah. No, no R. Kelly mentioning. Um, but yeah, it, it, it takes a toll. I mean, even, even with me, um, I was really grateful that as I was wrestling, I didn't have any injuries, you know, a few little boo-boos, but you know, nothing, no injuries. But I, I, you know, to this day, I have the effects of what I'm pretty sure was just one, one move in one match I had. Um, and I, the guy, Paul Birchall, it's another, another, um, uh, British guy he lives over in America now, but I had him up on my shoulder and the idea was to be, I was going to, um, I dropped my knees and it looks like a gut buster, you know, in the world of pro wrestling, it looks like you've, you've winded the guy. So you drop to your knees, you drive your shoulder into him and he, he flops on the ground and, uh, through, you know, he wasn't doing anything wrong rather than just laying like a sack of potatoes on my shoulder. He was wiggling, you know, he was like, you know, kicking his legs, making it look like he was struggling, which, which you know, was right. He should have done. But as he was struggling, rather than having him high and tight on my shoulder, he started to slip down my shoulder a little bit. So when I dropped to my knees and Paul Bircher was like 250 pounds, I, I think I momentarily separated my shoulder and it must've gone straight back in afterwards. But that, that stress, I think that trauma triggered and it took years to manifest itself, but it's um, uh, like osteoarthritis um, and a whole bunch of like rotator cuff stuff, which I forget the exact medical terminology. It's it's annoying. It's limited me in a lot of things I used to be able to do. I can still train hard, but for example, like overhead pressing, that's out. Um, I've had to find adaptations, you know, like a like a landmine incline press, for example. Um, but yeah, like I said, just like one random thing. You've got guys who do somersaults and backflips and all the crazy stuff, and they've been doing it for years and they're fine. And then you get, you know, one pretty innocuous looking move. Um, and obviously years down the road, it it takes a toll on you. So yeah, it's definitely something to be aware of if you're deciding, if you're looking to go into it, you know, it's, uh, it's accumulative in what it can do to your body. What did your training look like around uh, the time you was wrestling? Um, so just uh, actually, if you just go through like a little training week, for instance, say like to what you did Monday to Sunday, um, how many times a week would you train wrestling versus how many times would you be in the weights room um, versus how many times would you be eating all you can eat? <laughs> sure. Um, when I, even when I was up in WWE, you know, when I was DJ Gabriel doing my thing, um, for a more polite term, the, the training wheels were still on when they bring someone up, there's always like, um, the, uh, the training wheels area where 
you still obviously I was still at the school. I was still in developmental, doing my doing my training, doing my studying, and then they bring you up for what was ECW at the time, or a, or maybe like the odd Raw or the odd SmackDown. But I was still required to uh, to train um, at FCW at the time. This was down in in Tampa. Now, um, OVW had been had lost its affiliation with WWE. And now it was, I was at Florida Championship Wrestling um, in Tampa. So I was still training at the school and then going up um, once a week or, you know, maybe twice a week to, you know, to do like a televised show. So my training was still built around the school timetable in a lot of ways. So uh, in a typical um, week, you know, you're still training um, uh, like five days a week. And I think towards the end, because we had quite a few people, they kind of split us up in the morning and afternoon rotations. So for example, uh, if I was going to do my wrestling training in the afternoon, I might get up early, um, do a weight session in the morning, go straight from the weight session, do my training, uh, do my wrestling training, you know, skills, do my matches, um, come home, big lunch, uh, clear out one of, the, one of the local all-you-can-eat buffets. I think in the end they put up a sign, no, no more wrestlers, because we just <laughs> we just destroyed them. There was a uh, like a sushi bar. It was, it was a bit of everything, but we just used to clear out the salmon sashimi, just absolutely decimate it like locusts. Um, but you'd have a big lunch, take a nap, uh, go back to the gym, do another weight session or do uh, do some cardio, you know, do your skipping, do anything like that and come back. So I was, I'd say I was training uh, three times a day, certainly one weight session, my skills, my wrestling, uh, and then like a conditioning or maybe even another weight session. You know, I was at that age when I was still relatively bulletproof. So you know, I had no injuries. I had no uh, limitations to work around. You know, you're full of piss and vinegar and, you know, whatever, you know, just train, just eat and train. I was paid to eat and train. That was it. It was, um, it was, it was, it was a great time. What was your training looking like then? Uh, major compounds a lot of the time or bodybuilding so, style? Like, or- yeah. So I've thought about this a lot over the years. And the truth is, is that I trained far more um, intelligently. Uh, and far better structure after I left wrestling than when I was wrestling. Like in hindsight, a lot of it was just some real um, uh, like be- beginner level or, or lack of knowledge. I mean, obviously I, I did my, my PT training obviously once my wrestling was done, but I never, I had an understanding, but I guess let's say in hindsight, it was not nowhere near the understanding I have today. So it was typical bodybuilding style training. Um, I don't think I deadlifted. Uh, I don't think I did heavy squats and my thinking for doing that was I, I was aware of it, but because I needed my legs so much when I was wrestling, like I needed my legs to be fresh, you know, uh, like hitting the ropes, running, jumping, leapfrogs, drop kicks that, you know, when you get that soreness from doing like a heavy squat session, there's no way I could have done legs and then do wrestling training. You know, you'd fall apart like jelly. Now the, now these days I'm, I think I'd see that as a, as like a bullshit excuse and I would like power through it. But at the time I figured, well, I got good jumps, you know, I could get up, I, I could do a good standing drop kick, I could leapfrog. So I thought, okay, so my legs have got that explosiveness I need. So a lot of my stuff was was upper body oriented. Um, so again, it was like your typical beginner star. The thing which really pointed out was when I was made to switch from wearing my, my long my long tights, my long spandex. And then they said, um, we want to put you in trunks. Let's see what you look like in trunks. So I, I obviously had this tanned, I had this tanned upper body, you know, good, good size, good proportions. And then I had these little white turkey drumstick legs, just these pale white. And this is in Tampa. And I remember the first time I debuted it, we were doing some, some uh, local show at some flea market and we walked outside. I just remember I was tanned, tanned and strong upper body. And then I just had these hairy white English legs. <laughs> I just thought this looks awful. So it was there was a lot of uh, sun sunbathing to catch up on the tan. Um, I remember training my legs more, but again, compared to what I was doing after wrestling, um, it was nowhere near. I'm much I was much more athletic training wise after wrestling than when I was wrestling. I often wonder like if I'd had a better training knowledge when I was wrestling. I'm, you know who knows? You know maybe I could have done a lot more damage. But um, you know hind- hindsight is uh, is a beautiful thing. But um, yeah, more typical bodybuilding upper body stuff and then relying on my legs during my drills and my wrestling training. Well, you it was like, like a drop kick. Someone was in the face. Was happy. When, uh, when obviously we met you, your like, physique was amazing. And I think all of us saw a bit of inspiration in, oh, I wish I looked like Steve. I wish I looked like Steve. <laughs> the, um, 
wish I, was I, I know. I, yeah, it's like, I wish I was as tall as Steve. <laughs> <laughs> if everyone wants to no, trust me, you don't want to be like Steve. I um, I, I think by the, by that time, um, I, I'm going to call this like, and I'm going to give like a very short version because I won't waffle. This is like the Steve Dark Ages, the period from when I came back to the UK after my contract expired to when I joined um, uh, Pulsate with you guys. That in between era was the dark era, but let's just say that um, I had a limited food budget. Um, I was training um, TRX and squats and boxing, I think five days a week uh, when I was um, doing like some really um, low level stuff at a, at, a, at a health club just to you know get some money in. Um, so yeah, I was, I was lean. Um, I was doing a lot of body weight, heavy squats, doing a lot of boxing. So I think by the time you guys saw me uh, when I got to Pulse 8, I was, yeah, I was lean and lean and tasty at that point. <laughs> Probably a little snack. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> a little bit of filet, a little bit of filet mignon on there for you. <laughs> okay. So where, um, obviously you said you come back to Pulse 8, where did you um, go after that? Because obviously um, you're in the acting world now. Um, you could just give us a little bit of lowdown on one, I guess, how you got into the acting world and what brought you to it. Because, uh, um, yeah, did you enjoy this sort of acting part in wrestling and then thought maybe this is this is for me as well? Yeah, I mean, it, it was a huge part of why I like wrestling. You know, I, I recognised it for what it was. It was like um, a soap opera for guys. No, I say for guys, obviously. I know, you know it's just as popular with girls and demographics. I don't know. But from my, from my mentality, it was like an acceptable soap opera to watch for guys with all the athleticism and acrobatics thrown in of, of professional sports, you know, it was like ballet and American football, you know, mix, mixed together. Um, and the, the entertainment part of it was really what I found out was the most important part. Like you could be, you know, the greatest technical wrestler in the world, but if you didn't have the, the charisma, you know, if you didn't know how to talk, you know, if you didn't know how to tell a story or to make people, you know, to make people feel things that you wanted them to feel, it didn't matter so i it was the the entertainment side um that i was really keen on and even as a kid you know like we all did like watching movies and stuff like i grew up on american movies you know so i always had that um that idea in my mind um i just think and it's hard as well because i am trying to like dust off the cobwebs when i think back but i think at one point it was after the doing the the training at pulse and i had uh tried uh, ultimately unsuccessfully to get my own PT business going. I had a few clients, limited success, um, had one client which caused me a lot of headaches and it made me realize, uh, <laughs> I realize I'm preaching to the converted here, but it made me realize like, is this really, um, is this really what I want to do? Because I, I felt like it was, with me, it was like a square peg in a round hole. Um, I told myself that, all right, I went out to America and I did something crazy and I took a risk and I got some success, but ultimately, it didn't work out. So now's, now's my time to be sensible. You know, now's my time to, you know, play it safe, get some security, do, do something steady. But the more I tried doing that for me, um, the more I realized that I, I was going against the grain. Um, but, you know, to answer your question, how I got into the, uh, into the acting side of things, a lot of my opportunities came through doing screen combat. So for example, I um, had started taking a course in, learning different weapon systems and different characters to portray um, uh, like background, you know, fighting action and choreography on films and stuff. Um, so I had opportunities to get on TV, uh, get on film in the background, you know, doing, you know, little, little bits, you know, nothing featured, you know, one of those, you know, you blink for a second and you miss me because I'm like the Viking running across the screen in, in the background kind of thing. Um, but the, the one the one thing that made me decide to really go for it was because of doing this fighting course, I managed to uh, successfully audition for the interactive video game trailer for um, a Lord of the Rings game. So it was called Shadow of War, uh, Sh yeah, Shadow of War or Shadow of Mordor. Um, and it was a Lord of the Rings things. And I auditioned for it twice and I had to do like a fight routine and I got it. So because of that job, it was one of those really rare jobs. It was, um, it was a long duration. The pay was really good. Um, the experience from doing it was amazing. Even from guys like professional actors who've been doing a lot longer. Um, I hung out with the stunt team and I think ultimately it was the experience and it was also the pay that I received from that job that feasibly allowed me to make a go of it. 
um, I was like, okay, if I'm going to do this, then um, I need to move to London. You know, I was still in Wilkingham at the time. Coincidentally, my roommate wanted to live by herself, so I was gonna, I was looking for another place to live anyway. Um, and then I realized, like, why am I, why am I trying to stay in Wokenham if I want to try to get into acting? There's no reason why I should be trying to stay in Wokenham. So uh, again, because of doing this one job, um, it allowed me to move to London. Um, it allowed me to um, buy uh, into an acting course, you know, to get like my first professional training going. Um, and I would say from there, just things, it's just lots of little things that add up, things which at the time you don't think of, but just accumulate. Like there was no, with the exception of this job I just said, um, you know, this, this fighting job, going to Ukraine, getting a good payday. There's, there, there's no like big, massive breakthrough. And even that job, I wasn't like the featured guy. Um, I was like one of uh, like, I think four actors, but at the same time, I, I was in the, the foreground of the camera. So I made the move from running around in the background to being front and center in, in the camera. So I think that experience um, and the pay from doing a job feasibly allowed me to move to London, buy into some acting training. Um, and then from there, just little things, just accumulating, um, managing to find your first basic agency so you can join Spotlight, which is like the professional register for, for UK actors. Um, again, eking out little credits wherever you can. Uh, you're constantly like networking. You're trying to reach out to casting directors, try better your opportunities, um, finding a better, um, uh, a more well-established uh, talent agency, which I did um, uh, about six months ago, which is, which is great because I'm, I'm getting more um, opportunities. So it's just little things, little, little things that add up. But again, in the same way, um, watching uh, my friend Zhao in, in the sixth form, um, impersonate the rock, which led me on that. It was doing this uh, this screen combat course, uh, learning how to fight like a Viking, which allowed me to successfully audition for this job, which allowed me to move to London. So little things which you don't even think of as anything at the time can ultimately like snowball, and they can lead on to like major you know divergences and opportunities. You know where where you can go. Oh, awesome, man! I love I love that. What's um, what's been your favorite um, film? Um, or, or a series to be a part of at the moment. Like you've got quite a, a list of things actually. I, see, I saw um, you did some stunts in pole dark, which is quite. Um, I didn't realise either. Um, pole dark. It's, it's funny the pole dark one. I was a stunt double. You'll you'll never see me on uh, on the episode because they use the stunt doubles to fill in for the action which the actors were doing, so that they, they can then focus their attention on the crowd that was around it. So uh, obviously, if the, when they're filming the match, the cameras on the actors. And we, with the stunt coordinator, uh, me and, obviously, because I'm, I'm not a stunt performer, but because of my background, I was brought in with a specialist skill set in wrestling. So it was me, it was a professional stunt performer um, called Troy, Troy Kensington. And with um, the stunt coordinator, uh, Tony Luckin, who is a really awesome guy. He's, he's used me as in a, like a supporting um, screen combatant role on, on a few of his projects. But together, the three of us um, put together this wrestling scene. And it wasn't WWE wrestling. It was Cornish wrestling. And I, we had to YouTube what the hell That's Cornish wrestling was. <laughs> yeah, if, if you, I don't know, if you haven't seen it, obviously, I know you, you may have seen the Paul Duck episode, but YouTube Cornish wrestling, this is like an old school, goes back hundreds of years kind of thing. It's a very particular style of how to grab and how to throw. So even though I, I was a former pro wrestler, and I could do like some holds and some slams. It for me, I was almost felt like I was learning it from scratch when, when we were doing it. Um, but no, that was so that was fun. We would do the choreography. We would then teach the the choreography to the actors so they can do it. Um, ideally, all of it, or if there were some things they couldn't do, do as much of it as possible, and then um, step in. One of the guys might have to step in to do a certain thing if they weren't comfortable. And then once the camera filmed the actors doing the action, um, they would then get the actors out put in me and Troy, get us to do the same uh, motion uh, and then turn the cameras on, on the crowd so that then they could film the crowd reactions to what the actors were doing um, at, at the same time. Um, but yeah, no, Pulled Up was, um, that was good fun. I enjoyed it. And again, it was a connection through uh, the Screen Combat course, which I had done previously, uh, you know, with the, with the Viking job, you know, with the, um, with the Lord of the Rings job. So Oh, by the way, cheap pop as well, the British Action Academy. If anyone's listening to this and they're thinking, oh, that sounds like screen combat, getting involved, where can I go? Um, definitely recommend checking out the British Action Academy. 
Yeah. That's like a little thing for my sponsors. I'm going to talk about that first, but in the meantime, the British actually... <laughs> yeah, use code Sonic Steve. <laughs> yeah, use, uh, use, use code Viking Steve. That's Viking Steve to get £10 off your first sword. That's fine. <laughs> you just pay two. What <laughs> <laughs> code? Uh, so what's your favourite uh, uh, film or episode to be a part of so far? Um, anything that's like, really stood out? The one, I, I guess for me, like the, the most featured one is the one I've done most recently. So in a couple of weeks, um, I was in a, a short film uh, as a featured actor that should be coming out in a couple of weeks. And it's called Time Rewind. Let me try and say that without a lisp. Time Rewind. Um, it's uh, it's on IMDb. Check it out. By no means is it like a big studio production. It's not. Like I said, it's like a low budget short film. Uh, but it was a great experience. Um it's a, a small one, good crew, good, uh, good, a good director behind it. So, in terms of um, getting experience as a principal actor, um, I'd say that was that was great. That's one of the most recent things I've done. In terms of being a part of more regular things, there was <laughs> there was, uh, and it's still on Netflix, I think, right now. There's a show called um, Giri Haji, which was a crossover between uh, London London gangster and uh, the Japanese yakuza. And there was like a story going on. So Giri Haji um, translates as duty and shame in Japanese. My, my pronunciation notwithstanding. Um, the, <laughs> funny, the funny thing was, the reason that kind of stands out for me was that I was only involved, I think, in one episode or maybe, maybe possibly two episodes. But the funny thing was that about a month before we were going to shoot that, um, quite randomly, and I really don't know how I did this, but I ended up getting uh, a partial tear in uh in my left quad tendon and i think it was something that was always there it was like a weakness uh and then whatever i woke up one morning and i thought wow this is really sore and i got it checked out and i found out i got this so a month before i was going to be doing this action and running around as a gangster up and down stairs i had my leg locked out in a um, in a brace and i had to try to be as immobile as possible you know with the with the any faintest hope of, of getting being able to still do this I told uh, Tony, uh, the same stunt coordinator, I, I let him know my situation. So in the end, when we filmed this, um, I had my, it, it wasn't fully healed and it, it was a bit of a risk, but I, I wanted to do it because it was going to be fun and I wanted the experience. So underneath my, my gangster trouser legs, I had my full leg brace with my leg more or less locked out, but maybe only about 10 or 15 degrees of, of flexion allowed. And because I couldn't run, when we were doing the action scenes, uh, again, another action coordinator might have kicked me off you know, because I wasn't fully able, but they said, it's fine. We're going to make it look like you were shot in the leg. So they, <laughs> they gave me like a, like a, like a, they tore open a hole in my trousers. They put some blood, you know, they put like some prosthetics on there. So if you ever watch, I'm trying to think what, whatever episode it was, it's like a main, the main shootout scene. But if you see one of the British gangsters running, but like that limping straight leg run, that's me because I had my leg locked out in the brace. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But like I say I was just grateful to still be a part of it. So um, yeah, that one uh, that one always sticks out in my mind as well. Awesome. And I guess the biggest question is: so obviously it's a barbell episode. We're talking about uh, training and strength and stuff. Do you think all of your former training as a kid and wrestling has helped you advance in your career at the moment as an actor? Do you think? Um, uh, I know, especially for you, you're very strict in your routines of um, of eating and training. Um, so do you think that's passed over into your career or do you find that with your wrestling did, was that more of a um building your resilience and, and uh and consistency to training was it that or was it the training sort of thing if you get the one i say <laughs> no no that i think definitely in terms of like the, the lessons and the focus and the discipline that you have to have especially when i was considered a professional athlete when i was in america and you have that responsibility to you know to look your best perform your best train your hardest um, that's certainly something which, which has carried over. Um, my training uh, in, in the States and beforehand, before I got into wrestling, certainly uh, allowed me to build a base um, of knowledge and also of, of physicality, which I was able to expand on. Um, I think also knowing that I could have, should have trained more intelligently when I was wrestling fueled me to pursue um, my, my personal trainer uh, qualification and to you know, look at personal training afterwards because I was, I got more invested in how to optimize the body with nutrition uh, and how to train. Again, like maybe part of that was, you know, going back to what I could have done possibly with wrestling, 
or just trying to find like, what are my passions? What am I good at? What's going to make me happy? How can I turn that into, into a career? Um, but yeah, it, it's certainly things that I've, I've built upon. I think now these days, um, even though I'm older, clearly apart with the apart exception of my shoulder, I'm still good, you know, mobility wise, I, I'm a concrete block, but I'm like a mobile concrete block is good. Um, but it, it's forced me to think about my workouts more intelligently. Um, I'm, you know, the days of, you know what it's like when you're younger, when you're in your twenties, I've seen that thing on these shows, like you go through uh, like different mentalities in your lifting career, like in your twenties, you think you're invincible and it's just mass. You yeah. just want to get massive in your twenties. And then your thirties kick in and you think, oh, I, I still want to be big, but I want to be athletic. And then you get into your forties and you think, okay, I'm not so much worried about mass now, but I want to stay mobile and I'm concerned about my mobility. And then your fifties kick in and you think, I just want to be able to get out of bed in the morning and look good naked. <laughs> so it's like that sliding scale. But I think now where, where I'm at, um, everything I do, I'm, I'm thinking about um, the the form and the contraction. Like li lifting heavy weights, if I can do it with with good technique, then great. Um, but for example, I don't bench press anymore. Uh, part of that is because of my shoulder, and also part of that is the more I heard about um, uh, strength coaches far more experienced than I was talking about in terms of pec development, not just like moving weight, but in terms of pec development, dumbbells were superior to barbells in, again, I'm preaching to the converted for all the reasons that, you know, range of motion, um, freedom of rotation and movement. It, it's, it's much more joint friendly because it allows more freedom of movement. So, um, yeah, my days of lifting heavy for the sake of making massive gains are behind me. But yet at the same time, I found that by using um, relatively lower weights, but really concentrating on, on what I'm doing and just putting technique and contraction um, and making every single rep I do meaningful. Like even if you're just holding something or just like crushing the hell, if you're doing a press, crush the hell out of the handles. You know, it's, you can maximize your training so much by doing more with, with less. Having said that, like the legs are still good, deadlifting good, you know, squatting good. Um, but yeah, the days of the PB bench press um, and overhead press, um, are behind me but you know it's like you guys know the longer you train you know things come up whether it be injuries or you know little niggles and you just you just improvise you just you improvise you adapt you try to get the same results but you do so by taking a different path to get there and that's where obviously you guys come in because you can intelligently you know program that you know you can identify you know where um uh dysfunctions are how to work around them if you can't work around them you need to address them so yeah, training training smarter is so much better than just training for mass or just um, massive. Like for you as well, uh, uh, you know, the longer you train for, your exercise library just gets smaller. Like as in, you're, you're not doing dumb shit. You're just doing the stuff that actually works. Like you say, you're just, you're cutting out the bench press because you found something that's more effective and you're going to use that to more of your advantage. Yeah. Um, but obviously in a powerlifting world, you've got a bench. That's what I do. But like, yeah, exactly. Your, your training exercise library is getting smaller, but more efficient and more effective and actually more of a full body. I'm going to be a fucking monster approach rather than I'm just going to have a big chest approach. Yep. Absolutely. And like you say, it depends what your goal is. Like if your goal is to be the strongest in the bench press, then obviously you need to train the bench press <laughs> and then do a whole bunch of auxiliary exercises to support your number and priority, which is bench press. If you're, Joe Bloggs, Jane Bloggs, you know, and you want to get a bigger chest, then it's not about, you know, people always, always go to like the bench press as like the go-to exercise. But again, you know, it just, it just depends what your training goal is. You know, if you want to get good at a particular skill, then obviously you have to practice that skill. If you just want to get the result, then you look at all the other um, uh, options that are to you, you know, to, to get that result. How um, have you got on um, during lockdowns? Have you um, been able to keep up any sort of training regime, obviously to keep your physique and, you know, be able to look good for your parts and stuff like that? Yeah, it's, um, you know, like like the majority of people, you know, I don't have, uh, you know, access to like a home gym. You know, I, I I applaud these guys and these girls who have got like their 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 home setups. I'm incredibly jealous, but at the same time, I think it's awesome. Um, but obviously I'm, I'm in London, uh, I'm in a house share. So uh, no no scaffolding, squat racks, or or makeshift weights. <laughs> but with me, I found that doing a hybrid um, bodyweight workout with a few basic tools. Um, I got a, like a 15 kilo med ball, got a bunch of resistance bands. But most importantly, and this is like a real lifesaver from my dad who gave it to me, is I got one of those old school bull workers. Not sure if you remember those things. The 
So the Debbie, don't, by the yeah. way, yeah. If you haven't got it, I really recommend it in terms of a piece of home training kit or something you can take on the go, something that can stimulate the amount of tension that you would be putting into like a heavy lift or a heavy press. Ball worker, it was for me, it was a lifesaver. I think I actually got a little bit bigger or a little bit more defined during the second or first lockdown than when I went into it. So basically, it's just like a steel tube on a spring with handles on either end um, that you can compress together. And it's also got steel cables so that you can also pull apart as well. So, you know, for example, I could deadlift with this Bowflex. I could stand on one cable, grab the other cable, and I could do like, you know, obviously limited range, but I could, you know, um, I could simulate doing a, a moderate load deadlift. So I found that doing like a conjunct, like a hybrid workout of body weight um, and like this bull worker, for example, and everything else, for me, it was good. And I was doing skipping when the weather was nicer as well. I was going outside. I was, I was skipping every day. So, um, definitely ways that you can work around it but now of course i'm at the point where this is the third lockdown i've had to tweak i've got the same tools i've had to tweak them about as much as i can tweak them to get that different stimulus to keep going so um april 12th boys yeah we're looking at gyms back on (laughs) so i gotta i gotta i gotta keep going i gotta keep making it fresh for another month um and then i think my body will be well and truly rested from doing body weight and it'll be ready for uh ready for the compounds again but yeah I, i've been keeping myself going it's the hardest part with me is uh because i i mean obviously in a, in a house share i don't have like the free i have free reign in my house but at the same time you have to be aware of other people's privacy so a lot of the stuff i do whether i'm reading or studying or lifting or watching netflix or whatever it's always in it's always in my room it's always in my bedroom so it's i found it's much harder to keep your focus even though you're doing different tasks because your environment is the same it can often feel like i've just felt motivation wise and focus wise i felt it's been much harder for me during lockdown but uh, again i guess this work comes down to like when you re- when you make a plan and more important than ever when you go to bed it's so important to know okay tomorrow i am going to do this you know i'm going to do this 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 i'm going to read i'm going to study i'm going to make sure i do this exercise i'm going to do three i'm going to do no not three i'm going to do four sets you know so you set yourself a goal because if you if you wake up and it's during the day and you tell yourself well you know, I, I should probably do a workout. You know, you've, you've already lost, you know, you don't have that, but going to bed and setting yourself that goal, um, like you guys know, it's accountability. It's a way of trying to hit that goal. And then if you don't do it, hopefully that should piss you off enough so that the next day you go out and you really should do like a hard training session. What's, um, what's your top three non-negotiables then? So every day you've got three things that you, you have to do. What are they for you? Um, first and foremost, I found this just really good for my mentality. Uh, once I've had my breakfast, um, I like to, uh, this, this is, I'm showing my age now here guys, but <laughs> breakfast, get a book, something I haven't read before. Um, something unrelated maybe to acting or maybe something I find interesting, get a book, anything, fiction, biographies, sci-fi, cup of coffee, read my book for an hour. Um, I find it's so much better to get my brain my brain juices flowing rather than just sitting down and watching YouTube straight away. So first thing in the day, cup of coffee, read a good book, something that's going to uh, stimulate you. Um, with your workout, obviously you know exactly what you're going to do, uh, know how you're going to do it. With your limited means, find out how you can make it progressive. Maybe that means holding it for a bit longer, doing another set, doing another rep, feeling more contraction, but making sure that if I've set myself something the night before, that I'm going to do it. Um, and just eating clean. You know, probably, that, probably that's the easiest thing for most people. Uh, or it's the, it's the relatively easiest thing to do to um, look after your physique or to minimize any loss of physique is that obviously we're not doing the same activity level during lockdown as we were going out to work and, you know, back in the days when, you know, we had a life. So the easiest thing to do is just like, don't eat, don't eat the crap, like keep it lean, you know, keep it you know, really. So you know, my, my diet is incredibly uh, similar for each site. It's pretty much the same thing, which is a few basic variations, but yeah, especially these days when you're not able to burn off, you don't have that same energy expenditure. Cut the crap out, you know, be really strict with yourself. Um, and then, you know, when you're able to do, do more energy output, you know, allow yourself the treats. Um, but I've never been one of these guys where it's like, oh, it's locked down, I'll, I'll get, you know, a pizza or something, except my birthday, which I did eat a pizza and it was delicious. Um, but yeah, no, the, the more discipline that you can have now, I think, is going to be a payoff to keep your body in a better state of preparation. For when you can train harder you know if you always maintain yourself in good shape then it's much easier to get into great shape 
You know, if you're in great shape, it's much easier to get yourself into excellent shape. But if you let yourself go into average or below average, and you remember what you were before, it's so much harder to get there. So if you always keep yourself in a good state of, of preparation, and then going up to the next level is, is so much easier because your, your body's primed. You know, it's, it's like, obviously, I haven't lifted heavy weights, but I like to think now that even though it's, it's going to take a two or three weeks for me to get my strength numbers back up, because of how I've trained, I've kept my, my body sensitive to training. You know, I've kept it in, like, in, a, in a state which is ready to respond to training rather than letting myself go, not working out, eating what I want, um, and then suddenly thinking, out, oh, why can't I do this? Because, you know, you haven't kept yourself in a, in a state of readiness. Steve, we've always known that you're like a wealth of knowledge, but who do you, um, who do you look to to learn new things? Um, do you follow that influences your training um, and how you go about doing what you do in the gym now? Sure. Um, so these days I am mostly guided by my instincts of what feels good, um, considerations for my right shoulder mobility. With those things in mind, I then, if I have to adapt or I, I, I look at certain exercises which, which feel good, I know that certainly before my, my shoulder was my, uh, was my limiting factor. And you guys, I know I mentioned this to you guys a bunch of times when I was back in um, the, uh, the Pulse 8 days, but the two guys that really stood out for me, or at least who I connected with in terms of uh, a similar training philosophy and the results, because anybody can, you know, you can get 10 guys who can look at the same training strength coach and they say oh we all did the same program but then you know this guy got good results and this guy got bad results and this guy got really good results so you still have to find that that strength coach or that voice which then your body responds to but short version for me um uh pavel uh pavel satsalim certainly when it came to like old school old school training methods you know no no fluff um he's on teen nation yeah, T Nation. And you know what? Again, you know, first a word from our sponsors. T Nation is a great website for us. Um, but no, at the same time, it's so it's so good to go to a platform where there are people who know what they're talking about. So absolutely. Um T, T Nation's got a, a great number of strength coaches who know their stuff. They're peer reviewed. Um, you know, they've got the testimonials and and they've got the experience to back up what they're saying rather than, you know, some YouTube warrior, you know, that's just like telling you something that they, they don't know about. So T Nation, absolutely, was a great website. Um, but I know that Pavel, I've got a few of his books, was great, especially for, um, you know, when I was doing more like benching and compound stuff, the like the old school, like Russian, like or not even Russian, Soviet era um, uh, volume, you know, rep sets. That that was great fun to do. Um, the, I think the guy that I've, I've listened to the most and I've got the most success with and has um, benefited me the most in terms of my, my physical training uh, was um, uh, Christian, and I apologise if I butcher his surname. I I always try to find out the the precise way to pronounce his surname. But uh, French Canadian guy uh, Christian Thibodeau. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And again, apologies if I if I butcher that that last pronunciation. Um, Thibodeau, 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 but no, like his um, his approach was great. You know, he he took aspects of training which may have seemed a bit mysterious, and he made it much more accessible. Um, uh, I, I found just personally that my body responded so well to doing uh, a lot of the of the programs or the training principles which he did. Uh, I still, if I had to, I still modified some of them. I still made them fit me and what felt right. Um, but certainly, the most success I've had in my training has been um, through using a lot of the training principles. The methods, um, the, the workout plans of uh, of Christian Thibodeau. <laughs> um, very, very self conscious how I say his last name now. Are you still uh, are you still banging the Udo soil back? <laughs> Udo's man, I I love the Udo's. Recommend yeah, yeah. Udo's oil. No, um, no <laughs> Udo's. <laughs> so many things. No, it's um I've I've had to make some cuts over the years, just like budgetary basically especially now these days more than ever before um but no um i would if i had the if i was in a position where i could justify the expense of getting regular udos i think before i was doing it i was working three jobs i think at the time so i had a bit more a bit more income to go and spending out on all the supplements but certainly in terms of training subs I've, I've really i've really cut down um literally for me it's just um uh, the whey protein the casein protein 
uh, the Vitago um, for you know intra workout, um, maybe some some ZMA as well just at night. But for me, that's it. Um, you know, no creatine, um, nothing else. Not even the not even the uh, you know the old amino acids and stuff. I've and it, the truth be told, at least with me personally, is that I have not felt a decrease in my performance, and I felt maybe because I, I had I'd taken creatine for so long maybe it had lost its effect on me or just maybe it wasn't as effective or maybe it was in my mind psychologically wise who knows but um certainly coming off the supplements i was taking i never i've never really noticed a massive decrease at all in in my performance so i just keep it basic mostly that's just because of budget uh and just prioritizing it more on you know say acting courses uh you know <laughs> networking trying to trying to get bits done um but certainly from my days at uh, Paul say I've, I've definitely backed off on uh, a lot of the supplements I was taking. Yeah, no, I just always remember the Udo saw, but I remember like a bottle of that was like 40 quid or something stupid. I don't know what it is now. I haven't looked. No, I, I haven't looked in a while as well. It's, it's one of those luxury items. Like, you know, if you, you know, if you have the capital and God bless you, if you have, then I, I definitely recommend it. Great if thing to add, add into a smoothie. You, then yeah, go for it. But I can't imagine it's going to do too much to, uh, to a lot of my clients. But I always associate with Steve, the little purple creatine capsules. <laughs> to this day, I still take them. I think yeah. it's like Steve. <laughs> <laughs> But I, I, you know, I'm sure they, I'm sure they're responsible for some PBs back in the day. But yeah, I had that. I'm trying to think what it was. Uh... EFX Creole. Thank you. Yeah, that's the one. Get the code. <laughs> from Steve. I, can, I can picture it, like you know, like the Matrix, blue pill, red pill. That's like no purple pill. Purple pill. <laughs> <laughs> oh, brilliant! Oh, uh, wicked man. Are you still eating your quark? My days of quark have gone as well. Ooh. Yeah, I know. No, Change. it's just you've changed. You've changed. <laughs> Quinoa. Look, at this, look at this guy. Camouflage Quinoa. hat in the blue room. Quinoa. Yeah. Uh, I remember. No, I was bringing in when I was at Pulse Eight. I was bringing in um, quinoa, chicken breast, and avocado. Quinoa, chicken breast for lunch with avocado and pesto, and then I cooked up more chicken breast or turkey steaks, and I was having that in the evening. Um, yeah, I mean, I was going through the typical phase. I was just eating, eat, eat, eating. Um, and it worked, you know, it worked well. Um, but no, just over time, you know, things, things fade in, things fade out. Um, it's just consistency, you know, I guess if anything else. So, uh, normally I do like some go-to, uh, protein, protein porridge. It's always good to kind of keep you full, you know, get the old, uh, casein, you know, 50 grams of casein, whatever, hundred grams of oats. Water is fine because it tastes like milk anyway, when you mix it with casein. Give it a shake, leave it for half an hour, come back. Everything's nice and soft. Spoon out into a bowl, chop up banana, spoon of almond butter. Boom. What's, um, what's your physique looking like at the moment without taking your clothes off? <laughs> Obviously, because the last time we met That's was... paid extra. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm recording. We'll get into that. It's like, it's like, it's like Steve, Steve, we need the hits. Take the shirt off. Take the shirt off. <laughs> um, yeah, um, apart from hairy, um, I'd say, yeah, no, good shape. Are you, are you lighter or are you, are you, um, or are you heavier than... Because oh, what we're saying, we probably haven't seen you like good, good like six years now, so seven years. Yeah. So I'd you say are you, are you smaller. Are I'm you probably I I think I've dropped a bit of weight. I think back in back when you guys I was around you guys, I think I was probably around 100, 100 kilos. I think now I'm probably down to I don't know 95, nice, nice. 94, some something like that. So so leaner. Um, but yeah, no, I I'd say in good shape. I I got some pic. I I could always send you some pictures, but it doesn't make any sense in the podcast. Um, yeah, but nah. no, but no, good. Um, let's say I think most of it is diet, keeping things lean. Um, but no, I like to think right now. I'm uh, I'm still I'm still in good shape. I'm still good to go. You could, I I remember like, like listening to Arnold and stuff, and and other like uh, you know like Eddie Hall and all those sorts of guys that want to go into acting. Um, you know the the leaner physique is always going to be more better on the screen than being like an absolute monster, um, unless you're playing that sort of monster role, I guess. Exactly. I mean, there's guys like um, Martin Ford, for example, um, who just absolute that. brutish monster with the tattoos. Obviously, it's kind of like a win-win. Is well, it's kind of like a, a pro-con situation. Clearly, like if you want a monster in a film, he like one of the go-to choices. Like that, that's his niche, and that's great. So certainly, having a niche as an actor is really important. Like, for example, I'm by no means a mass monster, but if there's roles for like if they're looking for like an everyday type or like you know like the average guy type, you know, those roles aren't for me. Um, not that I would choose not to do them, but simply I wouldn't be cast for them because that's not. It's not like my niche of where I would go. Um, but no, you're right. You know, certainly getting that fine balance of looking athletic, I think, is 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 good. Um, 
there's still obviously still people um, will make first impressions of you if they look at you and you know you're in great like big muscular shape you know I'd argue that perhaps the first impression they'd make on you is okay this guy's a big gym guy probably doesn't he's probably not a professional actor you know he probably hasn't done any training or he's, he's not taking his acting seriously um, I would hope that these days most people don't and I'm really grateful that I've been taken on by an agency and I've I've done and I continue to do my acting training but yeah, I guess it's like um, it's like anything. If you're going to go into something and you're going to be a certain size or built, um, it's obviously just recognize that that is going to be your niche. Um, you're not going to be considered for 99% of, of acting work, um, but the 1% that will come across will be exactly for you. You may not even need to audition for it. Um, and hopefully it will be financially feasible for you. But yeah, the, the, more, uh, the more specific you make your look, whether that's um, physically or... Uh, your facial features or your acting background, you start to paint yourself into a particular niche of what casting directors kind of look for. So yeah, you um, you better have a good agent to go to bat for you if you're trying to get serious dramatic roles uh, and you're built like a huge a huge brick house. But personally, I think that's great. It's like that classic Arnold saying, you know, somebody says it can't be done, you know, or someone says, you'll never get these roles. You're too big for these roles. You know, it is it is great. It's the same reason. It's like thank thank you for telling me that because now I'll go out and I'll double down on my on my acting training. Um, and if I generally find out that I'm you know if I am too big, then fine, I'll lean out. Um, but you don't compromise on on who you are, it, and it feels great as well. You know, when you get when you get what you think is a red light, and you manage to turn it into a green light, um, it's a great feeling. And above all, the Rock hasn't done too bad with it, has he? So he's he's not bad. He's hanging in there. <laughs> he's, he's hanging in there god bless him you know sometimes when these wrestlers when they walk away from wrestling you know it it, it, it can be sad but he's yeah he's doing all right <laughs> you want to know when are we going to have our rematch i took the l in the first first fight and you took it like a champ man you took it beautifully <laughs> as well there is there it is the, like when to overcome the big guy <laughs> that was the um that was the michael j white uh scott adkins um, un- undisputed two fight i love that one that's it. There is the elusive photo. Remember, you did give me a tasty knee to the face. <laughs> That's very true. I was always looking for the final finish of that one. It, it's out. It's out there on the dark web. I've I've yeah. seen it floating <laughs> around somewhere in like some oh, the highest bidder, yeah, some Arme- Armenian website. I think you're you're like the poster boy for Armenian like protein powder. I think I've seen that somewhere. <laughs> oh man, love to. You know, it's, it's uh, a happy... I, might, I might need a couple of months for that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'd have to do uh, do a few bits of screen combat. You know, we'll start throwing in some polyprop weapons. You know, gladius. You know, nunchuckers, katana. Be what can go wrong? Be awesome. I've got some basic jujitsu moves, but that's basic. Yeah, and that's and and that's what I mean. I know, I know. I'm, I've shot messages with you back and forth since you're doing that, but you know, I'm so great that you that you, you've not only found that, but from what I can tell, that you've got yourself into a. Uh, like a good level you don't just do it for shits and giggles you do no, it and you no, actually it's, it's taste it it's good fun it's something different that's that's what I, I at that time I was probably going through a a, a, a dark period and it was mm-hmm. just something I could throw myself into that was totally different that yep. you know um, if you're fit and you're strong you're going to do quite well in it to start with but it's still going to catch up with you that technique overcomes like strength and fitness really so um but yeah i love it it's good uh unfortunately not been able to do it recently um, yeah can't wait to get back he's into been rolling it. around with his mate gavin it's yeah a doll. i've got a gimp yeah <laughs> a gimp doll called gavin. Like a little, little bum hole <laughs> <laughs> that's just for the stuffing it doesn't it wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't there when I got it <laughs> it's um, I, it's something that I, I really wanted to give a give a go on the, the gym I go to it's uh, it's not a mass commercial gym it's a smaller independent gym um, it's got oh, like um, out, it helps yeah shout out absolutely uh, Fight City Gym uh, there's actually two of them mine is on uh, is on um, in Moorgate on the Moorgate branch um, but it's great good it's got a good strength and conditioning setup which is you know what I go for it for um, I have used it for the, the Muay Thai um, they do the jujitsu, boxing, wrestling, as in, you know, grappling things. It's a great gym. The annoying thing with me, and I found this out fairly soon, was that with my shoulder, even though I, because I'm not in pain with my shoulder, you know, is obviously if I try to take it in a range of move, movement motion, it doesn't like, it's going to let me know about it. But something like, you know, BJJ, you know, it's like you're rolling around on someone, something which may seem like an innocuous move or grabbing your arm or turning it in in a way that would be no big deal for someone with a, a fully functional, healthy shoulder. If that happened to me, you know, it, it would be 
excruciating or I, you know, I might get my shoulder torn out. So it's, it's, it was a really annoying limitation. Um, and even like holding pads, you know, for someone, you know, when you do the classes, I love doing the kicks and the, and the punches. Um, but obviously if, when you're holding out the pads and you take that, that impact from someone punching it, even something like that, which is, you know, innocuous, you know, like that, I've got to be wary of that with my shoulder, just the way, you know, the, 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 the ball and socket which is really no longer a ball and socket, but it's that kind of impact. So it's, it's certainly little annoying things like that. Um, swinging an ax. Yeah. Well, the funny thing is with two hands, I can kind of, it's almost like a stretch. I can get that range of motion, you know, when I do it, but it's, um, it's like one of those things I, I had to tell, teach myself or train myself a long time ago to think about what, not about what I cannot do anymore, but to be grateful for the things I can still do. Cause um, you know, obviously if I were to dwell on the negativity of it, you know, it was a bummer and it, and it was a bummer for, you know, for the longest time, but you know, I'm, I'm otherwise I'm healthy. I'm doing what I love doing. Um, I'm enjoying the process of it. So I'm just, you know, grateful that I can still do what I can do. Um, I always think of, um, uh, John Aluman, um, New Zealand rugby player. I remember, uh, it was a video documentary or an interview, but I always remember something that stuck out and that he uh, told the interviewer that he only ever felt like he was, capable of playing at 80% of his potential, um, you know, with, you know, with, with his illness he had. And I remember just thinking that's insane. Like you saw, you saw how good a player he was, like what he could do, you know, his strength and just thought he's only playing what he feels is like at the most and his prime 80%. So I just had to make sure, okay, so if I'm at 80% now of my shoulder, I'm just going to make sure that my 80% is better than the other person's 100%. Um, and I think it's it's possible. You'll always you'll always be perhaps held back in your own head, but if you try to look past your ego, be grateful for what you can still do. Um, I think if nothing else, it just makes you let's say train smarter, improvise, adapt, work around it. Um, yeah, make sure your eighty percent is better than the other guy's one hundred percent. Awesome, awesome, man. I normally uh, we normally finish up with like uh, quotes uh, to live and train by, um, but I think I think you just smashed it with the nail on the head with that one. That was that was a great one. I will I will give you I will give you this one. And by no means am I one of these uh, like kind of like douchebags who comes out. Do we need a code or is this going to be for free? Oh no code. This is this is free. This is on the house. It's on the house. Um, by no means am I one of these kind of like douchey guys that just like drops random quotes that I stole from someone else and claim them as my own. But there's one thing that I do use on it on a daily basis, um, and that is um, hard work may not always result in success, but it will never result in regret. Nice. nice. That's, like that. that's 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 the one I've I've stolen, copied, whatever. But that's I say that's that's my one. Very good. Now that's awesome, man. Thank you very much for coming on. It's been a pleasure having you, guys. Awesome to see you, and uh, thank you so much for having me. And I'm, I'm glad that you guys are obviously raring to go. PTU has just gone like from strength to strength. And April twelfth, everybody, get your butts back in the gym. Let's make it happen. Let's get going. Let's get the economy going. <laughs> let's, get, let's, get, let's get the gains going let's, let's just let's just get it going um and i can't recommend you guys enough you know personally and professionally you know your stuff you've helped me um and thank you for having me on i really appreciate it awesome. thanks Perfect. steve good to see you buddy